Hello and welcome to my channel Biology by Katie. In this video series, whether you've seen it before or not or whether you've been following along or not, I'm making my way through the AQA A-level biology specifications. So today we are on topic 1.5.1, which is the structure of nucleic acids, specifically DNA and RNA. So we're going to be looking at nucleotide structure, overall polymer structure and what role these two nucleic acids play within cells. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you find it easy to understand and a good resource. And as always, if you do have any requests or recommendations please let me know in the comments. Nucleic acids are a really important subsection of the biological molecules topic. We have two types of nucleic acid that we need to know about, DNA and RNA. DNA will of course be one that you have definitely heard of before and probably seen it represented as its unique double helix structure as seen here. So DNA is made up of two polynucleotide chains held together by hydrogen bonding in between the complement, well that takes place between the complementary base pairs which will look at in more detail further on. RNA, the less commonly known type of nucleic acid, is a carrier molecule, so it carries information. It is a single-stranded, much shorter molecule than DNA. So DNA specifically um, stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and this is our genetic information holding molecule. So DNA is what holds all of, or is the molecule that holds all of the genetic information within any kind of cell. And then next we have RNA, which stands for ribonucleic acid. We'll have a look about why these names, uh, where these names come from. So ribonucleic acid or RNA for short, this is a carrier molecule. So it carries messages from the DNA to the ribosomes and allows proteins to be synthesized. Now, within the RNA section, there are a few that we need to be aware of that we'll talk about further into the course. So there's mRNA, which is messenger RNA, tRNA, which is transfer RNA, and rRNA, which is ribosomal RNA. So nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, are no different from any of the other polymers that we've looked at so far or that you may already know of, in that they are long chain molecules that are made up of smaller repeating units called monomers. Now, in the case of nucleic acids, the specific monomer unit is called a nucleotide. Now, DNA and RNA both have the same general nucleotide structure, kind of similar to proteins that have the, the general amino acid structure. So in this case, we have this general overall structure, but there's some slight differences which we'll look at further on. So let's take a look at the general structure first of all. So this is the same for both DNA and RNA. The standard nucleotide is made up of three separate subunits. So we have the phosphate group, which is here represented by this circular shape. Then we have a pentose sugar. So what that means is it's a simple monosaccharide, which is made up of five carbon chain. So we have a pentose sugar represented by the pentagon shape. And finally, we have a nitrogenous or nitrogen containing base. So the nitrogenous base is represented by the rectangular shape here. These three molecules are all joined together. So we have the phosphate group, which is attached to the fifth carbon in the pentose um, chain. We have the nitrogenous base, which is attached to the first carbon. So this is what our general nucleotide structure looks like. And it is the same for DNA and RNA nucleotides. Now we have looked at the general structure, we need to delve a bit deeper into the specific structure of DNA and RNA and look at how we can distinguish between the two, what's different about them. So let's start with DNA, also known as deoxyribonucleic acid. So we first of all have our phosphate group, that's common, that's the same in between both of them. Um, we don't really specify what kind of phosphate group we've got, we just know it's a phosphate containing group. Here is where we start to specify the pentose sugar. Now, because we've got DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, our pentose sugar is always going to be deoxyribose. That's the specific type of pentose sugar that makes up a DNA nucleotide. And here is just a structural formula of the deoxyribose, so the pentose sugar. You can see there we've got the five carbons labelled one to five with the various bonding happening with them. 
And aside from the pento sugar, we also have a slight difference in the nitrogenous bases that we can possibly have within a deoxyribonucleic acid nucleotide. So there's four different possibilities. So this nitrogenous base can be one of four. It can be either adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine, represented using A, T, C, and G, respectively. Now, adenine and thymine are complementary to each other, so they'll always bond with each other. They'll form hydrogen bonds on parallel chains change and the same with cytosine and guanine so they are complementary to each other as well and they also form hydrogen bonds and it is a hydrogen bonding between the complementary base pairs so a t and g and c that holds the two strands of dna together to form the double helix Next up, let's look into the specific structure of RNA. So again, RNA has this same general structure and we have the phosphate containing group, which we don't specify the origin of. Now, you might have guessed from last time, but the pentose sugar here is, whereas it was deoxyribose for DNA, it is just simply ribose for RNA. And here is the structural formula here of the ribose monosaccharide as well. Now, apart from the pentose sugar, we do also have a slight change in the potential nitrogenous bases that can appear in RNA nucleotides. So we still have adenine, we still have guanine, and we still have cytosine, but you'll notice here that we have a replacement for thymine. So thymine does not appear ever in RNA or in, a, in an RNA nucleotide. Um, and that is because it is replaced by uracil. So instead of being complementary to thymine, in the case of RNA, adenine is complementary to uracil. So that will be um, the base pair that when we're copying DNA, that will be the base pair that occurs. So we have adenine, uracil, Uracil, cytosine, and guanine this time round. So we've looked at the specific nucleotide structure of both DNA and RNA, as well as the generalized structure. So what we're going to have a little look at now is how they go on to form polynucleotides or long chain nucleic acids. Now, as I mentioned right at the start, because nucleic acids are considered to be our polymers, they're one of our four main organic polymers, they are built by adding multiple single repeating monomer units together, aka the nucleotide. If you have watched any of my previous videos or if you, you're clued up on, on polymers as a whole, you will know that the building of polymers is the result of a condensation or a series of condensation reactions involving the removal of water molecules. So every time a new bond is formed, we have the removal of a single water molecule. So if we have three new bonds, three water molecules are removed. So as I mentioned when we were looking at the specific structure of DNA and RNA nucleotides, I mentioned that of course we have the pentose sugar, which means there are five carbon atoms within our monosaccharide. So the nitrogenous base is always attached to the very first carbon, so C1, we call it C1. Then we've got C2, C3, C4, and the phosphate group of a single nucleotide, so its own phosphate group, is always attached to the fifth carbon, or C5. So when nucleotides go on to form polymers, they have a new bond being formed at C3. So this time C3, so the third carbon in the pentose sugar, will form a new bond with the phosphate group from a, another nucleotide, so a second nucleotide. And this will form a specific type of bond called a phosphodiester bond. So we'll have the removal of a water molecule and in its place a phosphodiester bond will form. Um, so when we are looking at the DNA molecule as a whole, we've got the the double helix, we call that the, 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 the strand on the back, we call it the, the phosphodiester backbone. And that's because of the multiple of these phosphodiester bonds. So carrying on with that point of the DNA double helix, we're now going to have a look at how this double helix molecule forms and how it's held together. So we've mentioned before that the double helix consists of two separate polynucleotide strands. So what we will have is uh, many multiple nucleotide units joining together via a series of condensation reactions, many phosphodiester bonds being formed. And then we'll have a another strand. So one strand on the left there, which I just need to add my base pair names to. So let's say we've got adenine, 
we've got guanine, we've got cytosine, and then we will have thymine. So to have the complementary base pairs on the other side, we're going to have to have thymine, then we're going to have to have cytosine, then we're going to have to have guanine, and then we're going to have to have adenine. So these are our complementary bases. Remember, A and T, G and C together. Now, between these bonds, we will have the formation of hydrogen bonding. Now, hydrogen bonding is the result of electrostatic forces forming between partially charged areas of the different molecules. So in this case, adenine and thymine form two hydrogen bonds and guanine and cytosine form three hydrogen bonds. So it is those hydrogen bonds, even though hydrogen bonds are really weak themselves, they're about one tenth the strength of a covalent bond. When we have hydrogen bonds in abundance, so we have a lot of them, they bring together this accumulative strength. So it is those hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs that does in fact hold the two parallel strands of DNA together. So again, staying on the topic of base pairing, we're going to take a closer look, delve into exactly why it is that adenine and thymine only form two hydrogen bonds and cytosine and guanine get to form three. So first of all, what we're going to look at is the fact that there are two different types of nitrogenous base and it is based on their overall structure. So first of all, we've got pyrimidines or pyrimidines however you want to pronounce that and that consists of cytosine uracil and thymine now a good way to remember that is pyramids are triangular they cut so pyramids they cut so c-u-t cytosine uracil and thymine and then the next type of nitrogenous base we have are purines. So again, a little um, acronym to help you remember is pure as gold. Purines are pure as gold um, with the AG standing for adenine and guanine, which are our two remaining nitrogenous bases. So cytosine, uracil and thymine are pyrimidines and adenine and guanine are purines. Now, here is a simple general example of both of their structures. So you can see pyrimidines are sort of smaller. Um, they consist of just the one nitrogen ring and then the purines have the two. So they're a bit larger. So naturally, the base pairs are consist of one of each. So we have a pyrimidine bonding to a purine and vice versa. So we'll always have cytosine with guanine and uracil or thymine with adenine. So we've got one pyrimidine and one purine purine. So we've looked at the structure and the organization of pyrimidines and purines, but that still doesn't really explain as to why there is a discrepancy between the number of hydrogen bonds formed between AT compared to CG. So let's take a closer look and it's all to do with the right conditions or the, the amount of conditions that are available for a hydrogen bond to form. So first of all, we are looking at adenine and thymine. So we've got adenine, the purine on the left hand side and thymine, which is the pyrimidine on the right hand side. So you can see at the top there, we've got two hydrogen atoms at the top of the adenine. Now hydrogens tend to form partially positively charged areas of, of polar molecules. So what we will have here is a partially positive charge on the hydrogen atom and a partially negative charge on the oxygen atom of the thymine. And therefore we have the perfect conditions for for a hydrogen bond to form. So between the two dipoles on either side. So we've got hydrogen bonding forming between the hydrogen atom on the adenine and the oxygen atom on the thymine. Now the same that we have um, below is we've got a nitrogen atom on the adenine which forms a partially negative charge compared with the hydrogen atom on the thymine which forms a partially positive charge and we have the right conditions for a second hydrogen bond to form there. But no more. That is the extent of where our hydrogen bonds can form between adenine and thymine. Now let's have a look now at cytosine and guanine. So we have guanine, first of all, which is our purine, and we have cytosine, which is our pyrimidine. So here we can see already that we have two hydrogen atoms that are likely to form partially positive charges. Now, if we have the correct conditions on the other side, so we'll have an oxygen atom there, definitely, and a nitrogen atom, both of which form partially negatively charged areas, so hydrogen bonds can form. Now, the thing is here, we also have a third way of a hydrogen bond being formed because we have the oxygen atom 
on the guanine at the top there, which is forming a partially negative charge. And we have the hydrogen atom right at the top of the cytosine forming a partially positive charge. And therefore, we've got the correct conditions for a third hydrogen bond to form. So here we can have three hydrogen bonds forming compared to the, the, the two between adenine and thymine. So that explains why, or that tells us that if we have a DNA molecule that has got a larger ratio of CG or GC bonds in comparison to AT or TA bonds, that will be a more stable molecule because it will be held together by more hydrogen bonds.